Okay, so I had another customer send me an Ames power inverter. This one is a PWRINV 5036W. The 36 denotes the input voltage, 36 volts on this one. 5000 denotes the power output, and it does say maximum 5000 watts. So this is a 5000 watt AC output, 36 volt DC input inverter. Now these are a stepped square wave inverter, which means it does not produce a pure sine wave. So one good note on this one is all the screws look virgin. They're not rounded out. Doesn't look like several people have been in here. This AC receptacle is mad. It does have styrofoam in it because it was packed in styrofoam and the little styrofoam balls went absolutely everywhere. I went ahead and cleaned it up, blew it out. There's another one stuck in the overload LED. I do see that the mounting feet are bent, probably from shipping. And so this is the back side of it, the DC input side with the cooling fan. Once again, the mounting feet are slightly bent on the back side, but nothing like on the front side. So the first thing I want to do is go ahead and just do an ohm check between these two DC input posts and make sure I don't have a dead short. And because California is one of the most namby-pamby states in the United States of America, we do have the California Proposition 65 warning that it may cause cancer. So we'll just do an ohm test between the positive and negative, and I see 3.1 meg ohms, which is absolutely perfect. If I reverse them, I should see a capacitor discharging and then recharging. Let's just check and see if we have any voltage on these. And we do, we have 0.3 volts, which is what's going on. So at least there's not a dead short in there. So next, I'm just gonna go ahead and supply 36 volts into it and see if it's gonna power up or not. Okay, so I do have it hooked up to a DC power supply that I'm just going to bring up slowly. We'll see if we can get up to 36 volts. That should be close enough. Now I'm going to flip the power switch on the front and see if we get any response. And we get absolutely nothing. Okay, so I'm going to have to put a resistor across this and discharge it just to make sure it goes back to zero. So I don't want to open this with 36 volts and all those big storage capacitors. That could be hazardous to my health. Okay, so I've got it discharged down to about two tenths of a volt. I think I'll be safe going in there. Let's go ahead and pop it open and see what lies inside. Well, this is about as far open as you can get the unit without disconnecting these cables right here and these two right here. But the first thing I want to do is get rid of these styrofoam balls that live inside this thing. So I'm going to go ahead and grab the vacuum and vacuum them out real quick. And then I'll go ahead and start disconnecting stuff. We'll do some basic tests and see if we can figure out why we're not getting power up to this microprocessor board up here. All right, so I have the two sides separated right now, and I just want to concentrate on this side, the one that I call the lower side, because it is the one that has the controller right here, and it connects up to the front board, which you can't see over here. So the first thing I want to do is just, I've got this on continuity. I just want to go ahead and check every fuse and make sure they're good. That one beeps, but I don't get it zero ohm reading. That's because I have seven tenths of a volt across that fuse. So that is definitely a problem. That one's good, zero ohms, zero ohms. That's bad, and I have 0.6 volts across that fuse. Go back to continuity. Good, 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 and good. So I've got an open fuse here and an open fuse here. Now, if this fuse opens to this transformer, this is where the unit gets the power supply for the processor and for the front panel display. So if you have an open fuse here, you're not gonna get anything, it won't even turn on. So you can have every other fuse open in this unit, but as long as that fuse is good, it will power up. So next, I need to pull this whole board out of this unit and go ahead and check all these FETs in addition to these FETs. But first, let's go ahead and check the other side and see what condition the fuses are in on that side. Okay, so here is what I call the slave side, the non-controller side. And we're good there. We're good there. We're good there. And we're good there. And we're good there. And we're good there. We're good there. And we're good there. So I'm going to say that the slave side is working fine. I do want to try to do some tests on these big FETs. These are the FETs that convert the DC that these transformers generate into AC 
for the output right here. This would be the 120 volt modified sine wave output right here. Okay, so next I'm just gonna slide the circuit board out of this, but before I do that, I have to remove all of these screws that hold the FETs to the heat sink, as well as these two screws that hold the big output FETs to the heat sink right here. And there's gonna be one, two, three, four more screws here. And when you do this, you always wanna try to just gently move the FET off of the thermal pad so it doesn't rip. Okay, all the fasteners are out. Keep in mind the short one is the one that goes to the nut to attach the ground wire to the case. The longer ones are the ones that hold the rails on to clamp the FETs to the case. Okay, so I've moved all the FETs away from the heat sink and the cooling pads, the thermal pads. So next, I can just go ahead and just slide the whole circuit board forward. And we'll slide the whole case completely off with the cooling pads intact on each side, undisturbed, so we wanna make sure those stay in great condition. Okay, so now we'll go ahead and check the FETs on the two damaged stages. So I call each one a stage. Remember there were one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight stages. So I've got an open fuse on this one and an open fuse on that one. So I wanna go ahead and check for shorts across these FETs. And I just wanna go ahead and check between the source and the drain. And that one is a dead short, that's a problem. That one is a dead short, that's a problem. Let's check one that did not have a blown fuse. And we see voltage climbing, so that is good. And I see voltage climbing, perfect. Once again, good, and good, and bad, a short, and bad, another short. Next, I will go ahead and do the same thing on the other bank. And I, I hear a beep, but the voltage is changing. So that tells me there's not a short there, so that's perfectly fine. I'll bet you if I reverse my leads, we won't get a beep anymore. Yep, and we're seeing charging, that's fine. Charging, great, perfect. Okay, so all those test perfectly fine. So next, let's go ahead and test the main output FETs and make sure there's no shorts there. All right, so once again, on the diode range, I just want to look at source to drain. I want to make sure I don't see any shorts anywhere. And I don't. So next, I just want to make sure I don't have any shorts from the gate to the source or the drain. I see a diode junction. I'm perfectly fine with that. And I see a diode junction there. I'm perfectly fine with that. So pretty happy with the output stages. So because we had shorts on the DC-DC converter, we need to go ahead and check these little one ohm surface mount resistors right here, as well as these four driver transistors to make sure that they test perfectly fine. But before we can effectively do that, we need to go ahead and pull the shorted FETs out of the board, this channel and the other channel, and then we can go ahead and make an accurate test and make sure that these little surface mount resistors are truly in good condition or that they get toasted when the FET shorted. All right, so I have all the FETs unsoldered. Next, I just wanna go ahead and check the driver transistors to make sure there's no shorts. I'm mainly concerned with zero ohms. I am on the diode range, and so I know that the base is the center pin on these. So I'm just gonna check base to one side and base to the other side, and I do see a diode junction, very good. Now this one is gonna be reversed. Diode junction and a diode junction, diode junction and a diode junction diode junction, and a diode junction. So next we'll check collector emitter, make sure we don't have any shorts. Perfectly fine. Next, I'll go ahead and check the coupling resistors. They are 10 ohms. I may have incorrectly stated they are one ohm. They are one zero R zero resistors. And I see 10 ohms, absolutely perfect. And I see 10 ohms on that one as well. So I wanna see 10 ohms on this resistor. I see 10.7, I'm happy with that. And I see 10.7, I'm perfectly happy with that one as well. So let me show you what I think caused the problem on this unit. As I was tearing it apart and soldering stuff, I noticed something, let me zoom in on it. So this side is the side closest to the fan, the cooling fan. There's supposed to be a resistor, I guess, on some models to discharge the big capacitors, the one that you can see kind of right here that says vent. Anyhow, they left that out. It doesn't really matter. What I see is carbon tracking because I think some moisture got into this unit. And also, if you look up under this diode right here, it's been wet and it hasn't arced yet, but you can see a definite amount of 
crud that's kind of grown down in here. So I think it needs to be scraped clean. It does actually scrape off very easily. It shouldn't really be a problem. I may go ahead and pull that diode out. But on this, I can definitely see a carbon path completely from the live side to the ground side right here. So this needs to be completely scrape free so it doesn't continue to carbon path. But I do believe that is the problem because on this unit there is overcurrent protection, but it's overcurrent protection only for the output circuit, for the AC output, not for the DC to DC converter circuit. So if this thing started drawing too much current, it could definitely take those FETs out, no problem whatsoever. So I think I have some FETs laying around somewhere. So I'm gonna go ahead and try to find a set of FETs and a couple 15 amp fuses. I'll probably go ahead and take this diode out, clean the area right here. We'll put the unit back together and see what happens. I do wanna go ahead and check the FETs on the other side of the circuit because once again, I've had those bite me in the behind in the past. So unfortunately, I do not have any of the FTP 23 N 10 A's in stock. They have a VDSS of 100 volts. The RDS is 23 milliohms, and they have an ID of 57 amps. But what I do have in stock, and I'm kind of questioning if I should use this, and I think I probably will not, is the FTP 11 N 08, which has a VDSS of only 75 volts. But it does have an RDS of 11 milliohms, which is much better, and an ID of 100 amps. And the only reason I don't want to use this is because if they have a battery that's up to like 44, 45 volts, well, now with the reverse polarity, we could have up to 90 volts, which is probably why they chose the 100 volt FET, just barely enough to make it by. As it is with 36 volts, exactly 36 volts going in there, I'm going to get 72 volts across this FET. So if the battery charge is up anything above just 12 volts per cell, it's going to probably wipe out this FET. So I think I'm going to go ahead and order the correct fetch for this unit and prior to doing that I'll contact the customer and just see if they want to go ahead with this repair see what happens okay so with the fets out of the unit now I want to go ahead and try to power this up and see if I get any results I do have three 12 volt batteries connected and as you can see I do show about 38 volts 37 and a half volts right there I do have an LED bulb here into my socket which is plugged in and so that tells me that all of the rest of the driver FETs over here as well as these four output FETs are working perfectly fine so I'm going to set my meter up here and hopefully you can see it I'm just going to measure the voltage right here on these two without touching them and I get 124 volts and so let's look at the frequency right now and we're at 60.76 Hertz hopefully you can see that but anyhow this side is working correctly so it looks like I just need to go ahead and get some FETs get the customer an estimate first but I want to check the other side just to make sure there's not a problem like I said that has bitten me in the butt before I do not want that to happen again so let's go ahead and we'll plug this back in and I'll turn this off and you'll see the light dim out and that's it. So, okay, so we know for sure the microprocessor is good and these six stages are doing their job, just the two blown out stages are not. I did go ahead, uh, it's off the camera, but I did go ahead and clean that carbon track off out of the way. So I'm perfectly happy with that. While I'm here, I just wanna go ahead and check these FETs, which are gonna be kind of tough to check because I haven't taken the crossbars off yet. Okay, so I'm only looking for shorts. I just wanna make sure my drain to my source is not shorted and it is not so I'm going to check gate to drain and gate to source and I don't see any shorts once again gate to drain and gate to source perfectly fine on that one so that's drain to source no shorts gate to source and gate to drain perfectly fine gate to source gate to drain, and drain to source. I'm perfectly fine with those, no shorts. So I'm happy with the second half of this unit. I just need to contact the customer and get some feds ordered if they approve the estimate. So hopefully there will be a part two to this repair. And if not, everybody, go ahead and leave me a question, a comment, a concern down below, good or bad. I try to respond to the comments when I have time. While you're down there, hit that subscribe button and like this video. It really does help my channel grow. Remember, you can follow me on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter at NorCal715. You can email me, NorCal715videos at gmail.com. That is the best way to contact me. Please be patient. I do have a full-time job and I do this in my spare time. Remember, with your help, we can try to keep these things out of the landfill, out of the recycle bin, and out of the e-waste facility. Everybody, thank you for making it to the end of this video. Bye-bye.